Hello and welcome to this video lecture about equal employment opportunity, which is the bedrock of legal fairness in the workplace. This is of interest and importance to HR managers, managers in general, and all workers in the U.S. Let's be clear though, these laws and such described in this video lecture are just the proverbial tip of the iceberg. HR students and HR professionals must be aware of many, many more, but these are the big ones. The ever-changing interpretation by the courts has placed a tremendous burden on HR professionals. I will provide an overview of the major laws, executive orders from the U.S. President, and major court cases concerning workplace issues. And then I'll focus on some specific issues of discrimination that are germane to this topic. Let's get started. Some of the main legal protections found in the workplace emanate from the United States Constitution. Scholars, lawyers, and judges have determined that some of the rights engendered to all of those living in the U.S. have special meaning when applied to work. The Fifth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution is about freedom from self-incrimination in legal cases and the rights of due process to citizens. When the citizen works for the U.S. government, the right to due process is afforded them in employment decisions and issues in the workplace because the federal government is their employer. Thus, the Fifth Amendment covers due process for federal employees, which can make it hard to terminate them. While it's difficult to imagine that anyone could be enslaved in the modern U.S., there is, of course, a horrible history of it as recently as the 1800s and before that in all sorts of cultures around the world. If you think about it, most of slavery was about work. People owned slaves to work for them. Therefore, it's useful to think of the 13th Amendment as work-related because it prohibits slavery. The 14th Amendment provides for due process with all interactions with state government, amongst other things. If you are an employee of any of the 50 state governments, you cannot be terminated unless under the guidelines of due process, which means that you must be apprised of the reason for your termination, you must be allowed to provide evidence to the contrary, you must be allowed representation by an attorney, and a termination hearing must be conducted where you are allowed to present your case. It has been applied in cases of so-called reverse discrimination, such as the Backey case, in which a white applicant to the medical school at University of California, Davis, was denied admission because they had set aside 16 of the 100 positions for minorities. In essence, he was competing for one of 84 positions, and all minorities were competing for one of 100 positions. The court sided with Backey, but cases like this live on in other states, and we've had a few of them in Texas. The arguments on both sides are quite intellectually interesting and worth looking into if you're adventurous enough and not overly sensitive. It's a touchy subject. Let's move on. The U.S. Constitution are a set of governing laws for U.S. citizens. There are other laws enacted by Congress that are not specific to the text of the Constitution, but which have never been shown to be contrary to the Constitution, so they govern life in America too, but with limited applicability. The Constitution is applicable in all situations. First we have the Equal Pay Act of 1963. It provides for equal pay for equal work, regardless of sex. This is not the same thing as comparable worth. For the same job for two people of different sexes who perform the job at exactly the same level of proficiency and who have the same level of seniority, they must be paid the same. The exceptions are for seniority and performance level differences. If a man and a woman have different levels of seniority on the job and or different levels of performance proficiency, you do not have to pay them the same. Whoever does the job better and or has more seniority gets paid more, male or female. This is why it's critical to document performance level and conduct regular performance appraisals. If there is no paper trail, then you might be open to some seriously expensive litigation. 
Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 prohibits discrimination in employment on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. Recently, sexual orientation was added to the list of protected class characteristics because of a case brought before the U.S. Supreme Court. This law prohibits discrimination except for two reasons. First, a bona fide occupational qualification, or BFOQ. The second is for a business necessity. A BFOQ is a protected class characteristic that is required for performance of the job. For example, being a Lutheran can be required for the job of Lutheran minister. Being female can be required for the job of ladies' room attendant in a fancy hotel or restaurant. The business necessity argument is based upon certain protected class characteristics being an essential part of the overall business plan. For example, the owner of a strip club cannot be forced to hire male dancers because the business model is probably designed to appeal to male patrons, or vice versa for male strip clubs designed for women. As mentioned, discrimination is prohibited based upon protected class characteristics. The legalese is classes, not groups or some such. Two forms of discrimination are adverse or disparate impact, and the other being disparate treatment. Adverse impact is an unintentional discrimination against an entire class of protected citizens via a seemingly innocuous test, and the latter is an intentional discrimination against one person who is a member of a protected class. An example of adverse impact is having a height and weight requirement for police officers. If the height requirement is six feet tall, there are very few Asians, Hispanics, or females who meet that requirement, and almost all of them would be disqualified by the height test. Because they are members of protected classes, that is illegal. An example of disparate treatment is addressed in a famous court case coming up on a later slide. The main difference between the two forms of discrimination in the very simplest sense is that adverse impact is against groups, and disparate treatment is against one person. Now lastly, sexual harassment is a form of discrimination based upon sex. I'll have more on that later in the presentation. Let's move on. Here are some major, more major laws about which HR managers must be aware. The Age Discrimination in Employment Act of 1967 prohibits discrimination against persons 40 years of age and older in an area of employment because of their age. This was enacted back when the average life expectancy wasn't quite what it is today. So today, it's even more important now that we are living longer and working longer. Hollywood TV producers, for example, have been known to discriminate against accomplished, experienced TV writers who are older than the producer's target market of 18 to 34. The producer's argument might be business necessity, which will likely fail, because it would be hard to prove that someone 40 or older simply cannot write for a younger audience. Another key law is the Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970. This law created the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, also known as OSHA, to protect workers from dangerous workplaces. Enforcement duties are split between the Department of Labor and the Department of Health. Each employer has what is called a general duty to provide a safe workplace. OSHA will conduct workplace inspections based on tips or past history or even luck of the draw. Business owners are allowed to accompany inspectors whilst on site, among other rights they have. However, they are required to abide by right-to-know laws for employees with regard to dangerous substances, etc., and they must provide a Material Safety Data Sheet, an MSDS, for dangerous chemicals in the workplace. Let's move on. Here are some more major laws. 
The Pregnancy Discrimination Act of 1978 prohibits discrimination against women because of pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions. You cannot refuse to hire a pregnant woman because pregnancy is treated like a medical disability and also covered under the Vocational Rehabilitation Act of 1973. This also protects women of childbearing age from employment discrimination. The Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 prohibits discrimination in employment against persons with physical or mental disabilities or who are chronically ill. A disability is a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities, a record of having such an impairment, or being regarded as having such an impairment. The first part protects conditions like epilepsy, blindness, deafness, etc. And the impairment can be anything from walking, talking, bathing, or feeding oneself. The second part protects someone who has had cancer or a mental disorder or heart disease. The third part is in regards to people's subjective reactions like someone with severe facial disfigurement. Conditions that are not covered by the ADA include obesity, substance abuse, irritability, or poor judgment. If an applicant or an employee requests a reasonable accommodation and with such an accommodation, the job or application process can be performed successfully, the firm must provide it unless it causes an undue financial burden. Undue financial burdens vary from company to company and are, in large part, but not entirely, based upon how rich the company is. For example, a small mom-and-pop grocery store on the second floor of a Manhattan building cannot be required to install an elevator for an employee. That would be too expensive for them. Let's move on. These are the last of the major laws covered in this video. The Civil Rights Act of 1991 provides for compensatory and punitive damages and jury trials in cases involving intentional discrimination. This covers U.S. citizens working for American companies overseas as well. This is a major revision to the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which only allowed trial by judge and did not allow for compensatory or punitive damages. Those are the two main differences, trial by jury, as well as compensatory and punitive damages. Before this law, the court could force a company to hire you or prohibit it from terminating you or require it to give you a raise. But that's all you got, the job or a raise. And then who really wants to work at a place that they had to sue? The Uniform Services Employment and Reemployment Rights Act of 1994 grants reemployment rights to individuals who enter the military. Employers cannot discriminate on the basis of military obligation in the areas of hiring, job retention, and advancement. Employers must reemploy service members called to duty and must reemploy them for up to two years after they return if they have to recover from injuries. Moreover, employers must provide a pay rate that would likely have been in effect with the amount of time served. So, for example, if one is called to military duty for two years and persons who remain stateside got three raises in those two years, then so does the returning service member. The Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act of 2008. Companies with 15 or more employees cannot discriminate against any employee or applicant based upon genetic predispositions to illness or disease. If employers acquire such information via participation in a wellness program or participation in a voluntary health screening, they must keep it confidential and they cannot use it for employment decisions. Let's be clear, there are dozens if not scores of laws affecting the workplace rights of employees. These last four slides only covered a few famous or key laws. A good HR manager and a good HR student stays abreast of the changes to the law. Let's move on. 
Executive orders are issued by the President of the United States. EOs, as they are known, apply to the federal government and to contractors doing business with the government or receiving funding from the government. If your company does no business and receives no funds from the federal government, then executive orders do not apply to them. However, be very careful. A court will decide that selling something to the government can sometimes be construed as doing business with the government. You should probably consult an attorney on these issues. The first of the two main executive orders for purposes of this lecture are Executive Order 11246. This was issued in 1965, and it prohibits employment discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin in the federal government. This requires development of an affirmative action plan, and it established the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs, OFCCP. Executive Order 11478, issued in 1969, requires the federal government to ensure that all personnel actions regarding employment be free from discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, and national origin, and that they are instead based upon merit and fitness for duty. This covers the federal government and contractors doing business in excess of $10,000 with the federal government. As with laws, there are a ton of executive orders governing the rights of employees and applicants in the workplace. These are only two of the more famous ones. Let's move on. Now we turn away from statutes, laws, and executive orders. HR managers must stay abreast of some important classic court cases, as well as recent and upcoming court cases. This is where HR managers who have no interest in current events or history will fail. The Albemarle Paper Plant used the Beta Test and the Wonderlick Test for promotion purposes. Albemarle's validation study for its two tests dealt only with upper-level, job-experienced white workers. The tests were administered to new job applicants who were largely inexperienced, younger, and in many instances, non-white. Because of this case, the EEOC guidelines require that separate validation reports be compiled for whites and non-whites whenever technically feasible. Thus, Albemarle's lack of a proper validation effort had arbitrarily set cutoff scores too high. The cutoffs were set based upon experienced white employees, not inexperienced black employees. They were guilty of discriminating in their hiring practices. In the McDonnell Douglas Corp v. Green case, the concept of disparate treatment arose. This new term, in essence, means that an individual has been discriminated against in employment practices because they were able to show four things. The first, they belong to a racial minority. Second, they applied for the job and were qualified for the job for which the employer was seeking applicants. Third, despite their qualifications, they were rejected. And fourth, after the rejection, the position remained open and the employer continued to seek applicants with the complainant's qualifications. This shifts the burden to the employer to show that they have a legitimate non-discriminatory reason for the rejection because the complainant now has a so-called prima facie case. Prima facie means on the face of it. These four steps, minority, applied, rejected, position open, are now referred to as the McDonnell v. Green rule. The Ward's Cove case involved a salmon packing company in remote Alaska. They had two types of jobs, cannery jobs, which are unskilled, and non-cannery jobs that fall into a variety of classifications. The former were filled primarily by non-whites, and the latter were filled by whites. They ate in separate mess halls and lived in separate dormitories. 
the complainant's statistical analysis of the issue was flawed in that the ratio at issue should have been that of racial composition of the at-issue jobs and the racial composition of the qualified population in the relevant job market, not simply the ratio of non-whites in the non-cannery skilled positions to the ratio of the whites in the cannery skilled positions. This means that every firm with a racially unbalanced workforce cannot be hauled into court and sued. It also enshrined the concept of a relevant job market, which HR professionals now focus on quite heavily. The case was remanded to the lower courts for adjudication with instructions from the Supreme Court. In the Meritor Savings case, a female employee was willingly involved in a long-term sexual relationship with her supervisor. The relationship ended, as most do, sadly, and she later applied for a promotion. When she was turned down, she sued, saying she had been discriminated against because she would not have sex with the supervisor. The company claimed that they were not responsible because they didn't even know the two were romantically involved. The court ruled for the Vincent for Vincent, under that grounds that the company had an obligation to know of romantic entanglements between its employees. Huh. Now companies often require that if a consensual relationship develops between co-workers, they must inform the company. Failure to inform can often be grounds for dismissal. Let's move on. Well, you may be wondering, how do we determine if adverse impact is possible? We use the four-fifths rule. This rule only gives guidance that adverse impact may be present, not that it is absolutely present. In other words, this is just a loose rule of thumb. Suppose an organization is considering giving raises to some of its employees. It currently has six black employees, three Hispanic employees, and 12 white employees, noted all here on the top row of this table. Further suppose that the firm give, gives raises to two of its black employees, two of its Hispanic employees, and nine of its white employees, as seen here in row two. That results in a selection ratio, selection for the raise, of 0.33, that is, Two out of six got a raise. The selection ratio was 0.33 for the black employees, 0.66 for the Hispanic employees, and 0.75 for the white employees, as depicted in row three. You'll note that this employment decision is not about who gets hired, but about who gets a raise. Discrimination in all employment decisions is prohibited by law. To implement the four-fifths rule, we must compare the ratio of the group that received a low selection percentage to the group that received the highest selection percentage. If the ratio of percentage to percentage is not at least four-fifths or 0.80, then adverse impact may exist and the low selection percentage group may have cause for legal action. In this example, the percentage of blacks, 0.33, divided by the percentage of whites, 0.75 was far less than 0.80 or 80% or four-fifths, and adverse impact against blacks may be present. The percentage of Hispanics selected for raises was very close to the percentage of whites selected for raises in that 0.66 divided by 0.75 is 0.88, and the ratio of over 80 Thus, no impact, no adverse impact exists for Hispanics. Let's move on. The method used to determine if disparate treatment has occurred developed out of its namesake court case. The case was McDonnell Douglas v. Green. The rule gives guidance on the determination of disparate treatment. We're going to go over this one again. Remember that this is discrimination against one person as opposed to discrimination against an entire class of persons like with adverse or disparate impact. Adverse impact, disparate impact, all the same thing. I say guidance because it is not a deterministic truism that disparate treatment has occurred, but with it, one would be hard-pressed to bring suit 
I'm sorry, without it, one would be hard pressed to bring suit against an employer. The rule says that an applicant must belong to a protected class, they must have applied and been qualified for the job for which the employer was seeking applicants, despite their qualifications they were rejected, and after the rejection the position remained open, and the employer continued to seek applicants who had the same qualifications as the complainant. Companies may have legitimate reasons for not hiring someone, and a defense can sometimes be found in their documentation of all the applicants and of their decision processes about them. Let's move on. Sexual harassment is sexual discrimination under the Civil Rights Act of 1964's Title VII, and this is discrimination based upon one's sex. There are two main types quid pro quo and hostile work environment. With quid pro quo, an employment decision is based upon the request of or performance of a sexual act in exchange for not getting fired, for getting the job, for getting a promotion, getting a raise, etc. With hostile environment, the workplace is so toxically sexually charged that it makes it difficult for or impossible to perform one's duties. This could include but not be limited to posting nude photos in the workplace, watching pornography on company computers, telling rude or bawdy jokes, groping, etc. Additionally, the harassment can be characterized as either severe or pervasive. Asking a coworker out on a date is not severe, and if it's only done once, it is not pervasive. If the coworker declines and states that he or she would rather not be asked out again, then don't do it, because doing so may be construed as pervasive, and depending upon the tone and intentions, it could also be severe. If a coworker tells a sexual joke and someone claims that it is offensive, then don't tell another one. Additionally, the court will use the reasonable person test that asks if a reasonable person would be offended. Some overly sensitive people may find just about everything offensive, and the court would probably find them to be unreasonable. Let's move on. The federal government uses two main agencies to enforce their workplace laws. The EEOC was created by the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and further strengthened by the Equal Employment Opportunity Act of 1972, which broadened its coverage to state and local employers and both public and private educational institutions. The EEOC is part of the Department of Labor and enforces various laws like Title VII, the Equal Pay Act, and the Americans with Disabilities Act. It also has the power to sue an employer on its own with or without a complainant. The OFCCP was created to enforce executive orders and primarily manages affirmative action plans. The plans are required for federal government and contractors doing business with the federal government and have three parts. First, a utilization analysis must be performed which compares the workforce demographics to that of the available labor supply. Second, Goals are set for the percentage of women and minorities in the workforce, and a timetable for reaching them must be established. The employer need only work toward them, so they are not ironclad do-or-die quotas. Third, action steps must be taken to recruit and hire appropriate numbers of women and minorities. Let's move on. Some, if not all, of the terms used here may be new to some people, so here's a quick review. Protected class. These are individuals of a minority race, women, older persons, those with disabilities, etc., who are covered by federal laws on equal employment opportunity. BFOQ. This is a suitable defense, an acceptable defense against a discrimination charge only where age, religion, sex, or national origin is an actual bona fide qualification for performing the job. Race is the only protected class characteristic that is never allowed as a BFOQ. 
business necessity. This is a work-related practice that is necessary to the operation of an organization. Reasonable accommodation. An attempt by employers to adjust without undue hardship the working conditions or schedules of employees with disabilities or religious preferences. Disabled individual, any person who A, has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more of such person's major life activities, or B, has a record of such impairment, or C, is regarded as having an impairment. Adverse impact, a concept that refers to the rejection of a significantly higher percentage of a protected class for employment, placement, or promotion, when compared with the successful non-protected class. Disparate treatment, a situation in which protected class members receive unequal treatment or are evaluated by different standards. And the four-fifths rule. This is a rule of thumb followed by the EEOC in determining the possibility of adverse impact for use in its enforcement proceedings. Let's move on. Well, thanks. That's all for now.